good uh, afternoon. We are the last panel be be between uh, the luncheon and the reception, and that's a big responsibility for the chairman. Uh, but anyway, I will try to manage. Um, modern warfare um, has at least one advantage, maybe. It is that it is less destructive, but nevertheless, war is destructive. A lot of destruction is caused by the war, buildings, factories, roads, public works are destroyed. Uh, looting is also part of the war. Let's think about the Second World War. Let's think about wars in Africa and so on. Uh, and there is also, of course, an economic impact of the war. There is the Trading with the Enemy Act. There is the economic sanctions. Uh, all those elements cause a lot of um, damages. Nowadays, there have been some international bodies which have been um, mandated to decide on the damages caused by the war. I'm thinking of the United Nations Compensation Commission. I'm thinking of the Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Commission. Uh, I've been involved in those two. Um, and before in the 19th century, there already had been some um, attempts to regulate the damages, compensation of damages after the war. But I guess the mother of all those fora which exist now uh, is the Treaty of Versailles, which has created, uh, first of all, the Tribunal Arbitral Mixte, which will be discussed tomorrow by Burkhard Hess. Uh, there is uh, the idea of the payment of a lump sum by the state to another state, and to some extent that will also be the topic uh, of our panel uh, this afternoon. And there is also um, the, the fact that um, um, very less known that the University of Leuven or Louvain, because that was the university to which Pierre and I belonged together in all the old days, um, has been the first entity uh, which has been uh, granted uh, direct ri rights as a private entity by the Treaty of Versailles in Article 247. Uh, the sacking of Louvain, uh, the burning of the university library has been an uh, arranged or, or addressed directly by a specific article in the Versailles Treaty to compensate the University of Louvain um, uh, by uh, providing books for 50 years. Um, that has been done uh, with a small uh, suspension uh, between 40 and 45, which you may understand. Uh, but then uh, Germany, the German Federal Republic, has then paid a lump sum to the University of uh, Louvain in 54, and that was the end of the story. Uh, but now we will focus on the Treaty of Versailles, and I have as my first speaker Jean-Louis uh, Halberin. Uh, he is a man of many trades. He started as an historian, and then he became a lawyer, or he studied law after he studied history. I do not know what is the best um, choice he made, but he tries to combine both. Um, he is a professor in Paris at the uh, Institut de, de National um, and he has uh, written a book which is quite interesting and that shows that he is a man of many interests, Introduction au droit en dix thèmes, uh, which is really has nothing to do with the history of law, or, uh, but it is just a general scope of uh, uh, the law in ten um, subjects, ten approaches, the role of judges, the role of the uh, legislature, and so on. Uh, Jean-Louis, I will be very happy to give you the floor. Uh, I am sitting very close to the rostrum so that uh, if uh, time is gone, I will uh, indicate that. I thank you, the organizer of the conference, for the invitation of a French legal historian living in the city of Versailles since 12 years. These are my only advantages. <laughs> Let us go to the disadvantages of my situation. It is more inspiring to speak about a success story in international law than about a failure. It is more exciting to study a completely new subject in legal history 
than to find his room in a rich literature about a well-known matter. Everybody knows that the process of reparation was abandoned after 10 years of successive attempts to adapt it. Concerning Germany, the reparation process gave rise to the payment of less than 22 billions of gold marks, what means one sixth of the foreseen sum in 1921. If the Allied powers, especially the French governments, were dramatically disappointed by this low score, the German people were upset by Article 231 of the Versailles Treaty. Furthermore, this fiasco was largely analyzed by jurists and economists of the interwar period. Concerning France, it is noteworthy that several theses in law were devoted to the reparation issues, even if they are not so interesting. It's not the case with the 1938 doctoral thesis in history written by Etienne Veil Reynal, which contains many developments of great interest. What is worth saying today about reparation? I have chosen as a focal point the Reparation Commission, I will abbreviate RC. I don't pretend to present an exhaustive study of this commission. The records of the RC kept in the French National Archives are collected in more than 4,000 boxes. And I have not been able to consult all these files. <laughs> Making spot checks in the archives, I would like to analyze the working of the RC an original institution based on the cooperation of national delegation of the Allied powers that tried to dialogue with the German diplomats. It was a political and administrative authority with some competence that could be compared with the ones of a tribunal. Before studying the attempts to make the RC a place for dispute settlement, it is necessary to begin with Article 231. Three stages about this article and three stages under American influence. In January 1918, President Wilson issued the 14 points, saying in point seven that Belgium has to be restored, what meant that compensation would be paid by Germans to Belgium because of the violation of its neutrality. There was the idea that the German war against Belgium was an offense to international law, whereas the war against the other allied powers was not a radically illicit war. At the beginning of November 1918, the German government and the Allied powers accepted to discuss an armistice on the basis of the 14 points. In a note written by State Secretary Lansing, it was specified that the armistice would imply the reparation of all damages caused to civilian by the German aggression. This note, enlarging the field of reparation, was transmitted to Germans and accepted by them. Second stage, during the Paris Peace Conference, the British proposed to include the war cost in the reparations, but that they had to take account of the American opposition towards a war indemnity. Nevertheless, it was decided to include into reparation the pensions paid to war widows and disabled veterans, what was not exactly the principle of armistice talks. In the same time, two commissions, one of the responsibility of the authors of the war and of enforcement of penalties, and the other about reparation of damages were established. 
whereas the first one failed to create an international tribunal on war crimes, the second one laid the foundation of the reparation process. And here is the third stage, again with the American delegation, which proposed to separate the issues of sanction and the one of reparation, and prepared the draft of Article 241. Read us again this famous article, the Allied and Associated Governments affirm and Germany accepts the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the loss and damage to which the Allied and Associated Governments and their national have been subjected as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the aggression of Germany and her allies. It is not the matter of a penal responsibility for a war of aggression, but of a civil liability in order to restore the statu quo ante for civilians of the Allied power that have suffered damage. The model is a private law model with all the vocabulary of private law causing the damage and the consequence of causing the damage is reparation. The different delegation have quoted the Napoleonic Code and the German Civil Code about the explanation of this article. The reparation system was considered as an expression of social solidarity towards the civil victims of the war, and a German writer called it a neo-collectivism or socialization of risks. Article 231 must not be treated as isolated and not in the erroneous German translation which transformed Germany in the also of war with the idea of criminal guilt. That is not the text. On the contrary, allied governments recognize in Article 202, the next article, that the resources of Germany were not adequate to pay all the compensation, and they separated the special case of Belgium. Furthermore, Article 235 provided a sum of 20 billions of gold marks to be paid before the end of March 1921. As accepted by the German government and by the German parliament, Article 231 and 232 appeared as a kind of first judgment to resolve the dispute settlement about reparation. But the question of fixing the amount of reparation was delegated to the RC, as the Allied governments were not able to find an agreement. It was a new compromise based again on American proposals to create an inter-Allied commission in order to settle this part of the dispute. The treaty insisted about the recognition by the German government of the authority of the RC. The German had even to provide for the salaries and expenses of the RC to supply all the information necessary to the commission and to accord to its members the same rights and immunities as the ones of diplomatic agents. As a counterpart, the RC had to give to the German government a just opportunity to be heard and to consider from time to time the resources and capacity of Germany. The RC was implored to determine before May 1921 the amount of reparation to draw up a schedule of payments, then to modify it according to the evolution of German resources. But the power to cancel any part of the reparation was reserved to the Allied governments. The compromise gave birth to 
an ambiguous institution that could be claimed a kind of tribunal. Part eight of the Versailles Treaty was prepared inside the peace conference, inside this commission with some future members of the RC. After this part eight, uh, there are two annex, one and two, and annex two fixed in 23 paragraphs the main characteristics of the RC. The commission was composed of one delegate and one assistant delegate for each of the four great allied powers, United States, Great Britain, France, and Italy, and in addition, one delegate of a fifth nation, alternatively Belgium, Japan, and the serb croat Slovan state. The permanent bureau of the RC was located in Paris, under the authority of a chairman and a vice-chairman elected by the delegates, the commission was authorized to appoint officers, agents, and employees. All proceedings of the commission shall be private, except special reasons decided by the RC. More original are the clauses of paragraphs 11, 12, and 13. The first one said that the commission should not be bound by any particular code or rules of law or by any particular rule of evidence or of procedure, but should be guided by justice, equity, and good faith through the creation of rules relating to methods of proof of claims. The price of this autonomy um, of the power to interpret the provision of the treaty was the required unanimity for all the questions involving the sovereignty of any of the allied powers for any postponement of the payment by Germany and for the question of interpretation of the provisions of the treaty. In case of default by Germany in the performance of any obligation concerning the reparation, the RC could only provide recommendation. Unlike a tribunal, the RC was not linked by law and could not decide self-executive rulings. The nature of the RC remained largely undetermined when its first meeting happened in Paris on the 24th of January, 1920, uh, you have here the, the list of the first member of the RC uh, with the different delegation, and I cannot give more explanation. You can see that there were uh, many disturbances in the French delegation that was also the chairman because it was decided in a conference uh, between the governments of uh, Great Britain and France that the president, the chairman, will be a French delegate. After ele electing Jonard, the ex-governor of Algeria, as chairman, the member of the RC agreed quickly about their work's method, meeting of the delegates at least two times every week, adoption of standing orders, choice of a British secretary, organization of different services, among one, a legal services. The RC was confronted with the two refusal of the American Senate to ratify the Versailles Treaty. It was decided to maintain the two American delegates as observers, and it is said in some texts as a kind of amicus curiae, and they were very active in looking for some compromise. The commission comprised a national organization with delegates defending their national interest. The delegates, accompanied by civil servants of their country, represented their respective government. If they do not agree with the instruction of their governments, they had logically to resign. And I said that the French delegation was uh, particularly unstable and linked with the different French government. 
In April 1920, when Poincaré was chairman of the commission, he recognized that the delegates represented their respective government and could not agree with too great sacrifice for their country. Despite this feeling of an inter-allied constitutional distrust, the votes inside the commission were in general unanimous and the French president used his casting vote only three times and not for the preparation of the rural occupation. If the idea of a French preponderance has to be nuanced for the RC, uh, it is difficult to say that it was a true tribunal. First, uh, we can say something about the legal service of the commission in which the most famous member was Massimo Pilotti, the future first president of the Luxembourg European Court. But this legal service was not very frequently consulted and uh, the opinion of the legal service uh, played a small role in the uh, commission. Uh, there were also problems when the commission decided to open a secondary office in Berlin. It was very difficult to dilute the principle of national representation. Each delegate uh, wanted to have one uh, delegate in Berlin and not uh, one uh, international delegate for the whole commission. There were also problems of leakage of information through uh, national delegation. One can also speak of a gap between the discourses and the reality about the nature of the powers of the RC. It was repeated that the commission had to be impartial and just as a kind of sovereign tribunal. Uh, very curiously, in the English version of the minutes, it is called a court of appeal and in the French, uh, version, une cour de cassation. Judging the claims of the Allied power and taking account of the arguments of the German Kriegslasten Commission. But it cannot be seriously said that the RC made impartial rulings among equal litigants. The delegates were both judges and parties representing the Allied government and distrusting the German government accused to present very low figures about the reparation and not to respect the coal deliveries very soon in July 1920. The commission could realize a very important work about the calculation of the claims presented by each country about its own active date of reparation. It was a work of 16 months with very serious reports. But when came the moment of the decision, the RC did not create rules relating to the methods of proof of claim. The uh, amount of the schedule of payments was decided in an unofficial bargaining, especially between the British and the French delegate, and the official meeting to uh, fix the amount took uh, less than 45 minutes, uh, according to the minute of the meeting. Uh, afterwards, uh, and very soon, the commission was bypassed by the governmental conference. It was short-circuited in 1921 by the French-German agreement about reparation in kind. In March 1922, the RC imposed unanimously severe conditions to allow a delay to Germany. But a few months later, with the sensational fall of the mark, and the German request for a new moratorium, the RC was clearly divided. Bradbury, the English delegate, proposed a complete plan for rescheduling the German date that was rejected by a vote, 
and replaced by an Italian-Belgian proposal enjoining the German government to make a deep financial and monetary reform. In December 1922, if the Commission appeared unanimous to take note of the non-execution of wood then coal deliveries, the British delegate did not vote the declaration about a default that was for the French the argument for the rural occupation. Before the end of the rural crisis and the devastator of the RC in favor of a bull of bankers, seven years before the commission being disbanded in 1930, the idea of the RC as a judicial body sank because of the lack of independence of its members. Delegates are not judges. Thank you very much for uh, this introduction. And now what will happen after uh, the period you have described will be discussed by Pierre D'Argent, who is a professor at the University of Louvain. Uh, he's also a practitioner in Brussels, and in that capacity, he has saved Belgium a lot of money by winning the Pingang um, arbitration, for which I am eternally grateful. Uh, Pierre, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, this is a talk about money. Uh, the conversion of reparation into sovereign debts. But first, of course, let me um, address my first words of gratitude to the uh, directors of the Institute for hosting us and for this wonderful conference. And I would like to introduce my talk about the conversion of reparation into sovereign debts by a sentence. And actually, that sentence at the same time introduces and summarizes this talk. And the sentence is as follows. International morality, interpreted as a crude legalism, might be very injurious to the world. The sentence is from John Maynard Keynes, who was, as we all know, a very early critique of the Versailles settlement, of the disaster resulting from the inclusion of war pensions as head of damage, and of the economic unsustainability of their overall reparation regime. And the sentence says it all. After the first total war of modern times, during which all classes of citizens had been called to fight and to die, after a war that was for the first time not left to professional soldiers or mercenaries, after an industrialized war of unprecedented scale, after a war that invented war cemeteries and implanted them in the European landscape for centuries to come, after such a war, the demands of morality were running high. And those demands were turned into law through a treaty that was imagined to be a founding stone for a lasting peace. But there is only so much that law can achieve and deliver. And it was later for the economists and the financiers to fix the sort of monster that politicians and diplomats turned legislatures of peace had invented. The history of the interwar period in relation to the reparation issue makes a fascinating story. A fascinating story that mixes the disillusion stemming from unmet naive legal expectations the insistence of complying with legal obligations, after all, pacta sunt servanda, and how hurtful it can be for the creditor itself, and also how slowly a professional class of experts, the economists, a professional class of experts who were about to take over and to intellectually dominate the rest of the 20th century, who that class of, exper of experts replaced morality, turned into law by pragmatism and finance. So before addressing uh, that history of the implementation of Article 231, let me give you some 
let me give you some concrete idea about what this 132 billion gold marks meant concretely. And the schedule of payment, uh, the London schedule of payment of 1921, we need to remember that. Uh, under that schedule of payment, fixing uh, the debt, the German debt to 132 billion gold marks, Germany, under that schedule of payment, was supposed to make payments until, ladies and gentlemen, the 31st of March, 1988. So the political confidence in a stable and predictable future stemming from such schedule of payment seems simply incredible today. It is as if we would make plans today about the repayment of the Greek debt until 2085. However, 132 billion gold marks even, is even more abstract as a, as a number. And in order to measure the magnitude of the reparation debt, not only over time, but in real economic terms, it is useful to put it in today's value. 132 billion gold marks is the equivalent of about $450 billion in today's dollars. To give you an idea, $450 billion is approximately the GDP of a state like Belgium or a state like Austria. In 1913, just before the war started, Germany's GDP was approximately $441 billion in today's dollar. So 132 billion gold marks was a claim equivalent to the German pre-war GDP. In other words, under Versailles, Germany was supposed to transfer, to transfer to its creditors an amount equivalent to the market value of all final goods and services produced in Germany in one year just before the war. But of course, that was to supposedly be diluted over 67 years. Let me make things even more concrete. This year, 2017, the total education budget of Germany was approximately $20.7 billion. Yes, it's in euros, but I converted to keep uh, dollars for uh, the comparison. In other words, 132 billion gold marks to be paid by Germany under the Versailles reparation scheme roughly amounts to 22 years of today's German expenditure for education. Primary school, secondary school, education, kindergarten, all together. Economically speaking, claiming that amount is the same as requesting that during a whole generation, Germany be turned into a pastoral country of uneducated citizens, or if we postpone payments until 2085, to request that the German education budget be cut by a third for the next 67 years. And of course, it is no surprise that Versailles has been characterized as economic vivisection, to use the words of John Wheeler Bennett. And with that in mind, let me quickly go through the various efforts, be them unilateral or multilateral, that were, taken, uh, that were undertaken uh, to try to make the reparation claim real. And I will uh, take the history just where uh, uh, Jean-Louis Alperin has left it uh, in 1923. Uh, the G Germany stopped certain deliveries. The new French government of Poincaré requested productive guarantees for German payments. It was refused by Britain at the Reparation Commission, and then French and Belgian troops entered and occupied the Ruhr region. And the purpose of the occupation was to seize, as a means of direct payment, part of the German coal and industrial output. And of course, as states always do, of course France and Belgium pretended to act in accordance with the Versailles Treaty provisions, while the UK, being divided on that, and Germany disagreed. But as Charles de Vichère put it, the legal argument was, I quote, a dead-end casuistic. The fact of the matter was that the creditors had fatally wounded their debtor. While in April 23, one gold mark was worth about 6,000 marks used in the real economy, it was worth a trillion a thousand billion 
a trillion marks in December of the same year, collecting the needed gold marks to comply with the London schedule of payment became simply impossible after such unmatched devaluation of the currency. Unmatched devaluation that is still part, as we know, of the collective political imagination in Germany today and explains its obsession about having the containment of inflation as the core policy objective of the European Central Bank. The past is so much present. Chancellor Kuno was replaced by Stresemann, who decided to end passive resistance in the Ruhr and to return to a negotiated settlement. And that was agreed. In November 23, the Reparation Commission appointed a committee chaired by US General Charles Doze, tasked with the return of monetary stability in Germany. The Doze Plan is a complex set of five interrelated agreements approved in London in August 24. The basis of the Doze Plan was the return to German fiscal and economic unity, which meant the end of the rural occupation. The basic novelty of the Doze Plan was to distinguish between the capacity of Germany to pay reparation and the transfer of massive wealth to the creditor nations. Under the Doze Plan, Germany was made to pay yearly installments partly defined uh, by a prosperity index, and those um, installments were designed to include all debts owed by Germany under the Versailles Treaty. What was precisely included in those installments was of course subject to legal dispute, to interpretation, and interpretation to be decided by an, arbitra uh, an arbitration tribunal. Uh, that tribunal issued several awards, but the precise details of those awards are unimportant for now. What is important, however, is to recall that the German payments were made by Germany in German currency and in Germany itself, in Germany to an account that was open in the books of a profoundly reformed Reichsbank in the name of the, an account open in the name of the Agent General for Reparation Payments. The purpose of such internal collection of debt and avoidance of massive international transfer of wealth was to prevent an increased competition by German manufacturers on the world market. Indeed, and as it was said at the time of the Versailles Treaty by economists that were critical of the settlement, deciding on the amount of reparation exacted from Germany was actually, in economic terms, deciding on the extent of the services that the creditor nations would accept, were ready to accept Germany to render to the world. In other words, prior to the Doze plan, the reparation payments made by Germany were actually detrimental to their legal beneficiaries. Indeed, in order to pay the various installments in the currencies of the creditor nations, Germany had to compete on world markets with the producers from those beneficiary nations, France, Italy, Belgium, the UK. Therefore, limiting those creditor nations' exports and creating economic downturn, downturn at home in the creditor nations while turning Germany into the workshop of the world. And in the course of time, the, the DOS plan actually worked. Economic stability and also German capital were brought back to Germany. At the same time, as we know, the political mood had changed for better. The Locarno Pact was concluded in 25. Germany joined the League of Nations in September 26. The Kellogg-Briand Pact was concluded in Paris in 28. But because the Doze Plan remained open-ended, and because also, legally speaking, uh, the Doze Plan left the London schedule of payment unaffected, it was felt necessary to agree on a final settlement uh, of the re reparation debt. Uh, and the purpose of a final settlement was indeed to try to achieve financial predictability and a prolonged stability. And also, the European creditors of Germany 
came to realize that the sums of money collected by Germany and paid to the agent general and then transferred to the victorious powers, uh, that those amount of money were immediately used in their national budgets to pay back the loans that they had contracted with the United States of America during the conflict in order to keep fighting, in order to sustain their own war efforts. And in a way, and in light of the financial cycle by which the payments received from Germany were just passing through the victorious European powers and then uh, channeled to the United States, uh, they were used, German reparation money was just used to repay, financially speaking, just to repay U.S. war loans. The reparation payments did not really make good any damage in the countries that had suffered from the German invasion. Therefore, the European creditors felt that it was the right time to change the Dawes plan into a more final settlement that would link what was legally distinct, but nevertheless financially linked, that is the German reparation payments and the repayment to the United States of the war loans. And under the chairmanship of Owens uh, D. Young, Young was a former member of the Doors Commission and also a former uh, agent uh, general, a committee of independent experts uh, jointly appointed by the Reparation Com Commission, the US government, and for the first time also by the German government, a committee of experts issued a report in June 29. The report was finally approved in The Hague in January 1930. Under the Jung plan, the Reparation Commission was dissolved together with various guarantee mechanisms under the Dose plan, and all that was replaced by the newly established Bank for International Settlements, an institution that is still with us today, that sits in Basel, and that was instituted as trustee of the creditor nations and the bank was charged with allocating to each of them the newly yearly installments under the Jung plan. And according to the plan, to the Jung plan, during a first period of 37 years, ending in 1966, each German installment was to be composed, was to be made of two parts. A first unconditional part, that was about a third of the installment, and then two thirds of the installment, of the yearly installment, uh, were made of a deferable part that Germany could decide to postpone in case of economic hardship. And after 67, after 1967, under the Jung plan, the installments due until 1988, the date was not changed, those installments uh, between 67 and 88 would only be made of the deferable part of uh, uh, the German debt. And that part incurred interests and was financed by a consortium of US Bank and uh, coordinated by JP Morgan. That latest deferable part of the installments corresponded to the sums that were needed for the service of the inter-allied war loans. Thus, in such a way, Germany was somehow subrogated in the obligations owed by its war reparation creditors to the United States of America. A link, a link between war reparations on the one hand and inter-allied war loans on the other hand was thus established. But it was not specifically agreed that the postponement, postponement by Germany of the variable part of the installment would authorize the European uh, allied to suspend the service of their debt to the US. The US did not agree to that. However, it was agreed that if the US were to cancel or reduce the war loans, Germany would automatically benefit from such reduction. And in addition to all that, as I said, reparation bonds were issued on the deferable part of the installments in order to cash in immediately and depoliticize the payment issue. Financial instruments were used and the public, that is individuals, banks, corporations, the public instead of states, 
became creditors of Germany by purchasing those bonds that could be exchanged and traded on the world market. Under its own terms, the Jung Plan was a complete and final settlement of the financial issues that arose uh, out of the Great War. It operated a kind of juridical novatio for all the previous conventional arrangements. However, it was without prejudice to the infamous Article 231, the Kriegsschuld uh, Article of Versailles. The Jung Plan entered into force in May 30, but very soon, of course, the disastrous consequences of the 29 financial crisis were felt, and Germany requested a new moratorium on its obligations. In August 31, such moratorium was agreed by the US President Hoover for one year, and it was applied on all interstate payments, be them reparation payments or war loans. A new revised plan was designed in Lausanne in July 32, most part of the Jung plan was supposed to be terminated and replaced by the insurance by Germany of tradable bonds for a total value of 3 billion gold Reichsmark with 5% interest. However, the Lausanne Agreement never entered into force because Belgium, France, Italy, and the UK agreed to postpone its ratification until, I quote, until a satisfactory settlement has been reached between them and their own creditors, that is the United States of America. And such settlement of the war loans issue never occurred. And the Lausanne Agreement failed to replace the Jung Plan. However, Germany considered that, the new, uh, that a new situation had arisen, that the Jung Plan was not to be brought back in full force, and Germany called for a new diplomatic conference. And such conference never met. Hitler came to power and he suspended the payments, including the service of the reparation bonds that were constituted as private legal titles, distinct and separate from the interstate debts, and as a matter of law, unaffected by the legal uncertainties surrounding the legal status of the Jung plan resulting from the failed Lausanne settlement. After the Second World War, the 1953 London Agreement on German external debt deferred, sine die, the settlement of World War II, of World War I governmental claims, while World War II claims were deferred until German reunification. And as we know, the Bundesverfassungsgericht has interpreted the uh, 2 plus 4 Moscow Treaty of 1991 that paved the way to German reunification. Uh, the Constitutional Court of Germany interpreted that treaty as putting an end to the deferral of World War II, of World War II claims under the 53 London Agreement on German External Debts. As far as World War I reparation bonds issued on world markets, the 53 uh, the, the Annex I uh, to the London Agreement of 53 set out a complex scheme of gradual payments with deferred maturities and interest rates. Arbitration happened between Belgium and Germany in 1980 about the Jung Plan loans uh, and the interpretation of the depreciation clause uh, in the agreement after the re-evaluation of the Deutsche Mark in 61 and 69 whatever the details. Overall, the bonds were roughly paid back in 83, and one outstanding debt was still pending, uh, and Germany finally paid in October uh, 2010, some 92 years after Versailles. If I have still have two minutes, Mr. Chairman, what can be gathered from that long and complex history? Well, I would like to conclude with two short, concise points. First, hmm. As we all know from our own personal experience through our mortgages and bank debts, finance, finance is an incredible time machine. It helps to cash in, it helps to get cash now while deferring to later the service of the debt, thanks simply to a promise, to, a tr to, to 
the bank trusts you. Of course, you need sometimes to put a collateral on the table, but the basic mechanism. <laughs> but the, if you want to de, if you if you want if you aim for a lower interest rate, it's better to have a good collateral. But but the basic instrument of finance is that you get cash now in exchange of a promise. It's extraordinary, and it is a time machine, as we all know. We can, you know, buy a house and pay back in 20, 30 years. And in the meantime, of, of course, your promise to repay the bank is sold 25 times all over the planet. Uh, but it also confirms, I think, what everybody suspects. While it seems to depoliticize governmental debts by diluting them into the anonymity of the public, resorting to financial instruments paradoxically makes debts stronger and more lasting over time. And somehow it is a lesson of humility for the public international lawyers among us. On the long term, the private law instruments are more resilient and beat public law instruments. And this is probably because the subject at stake, the, the, the uh, dramatis personae, the subjects at stakes are hidden in the public. The anonymity that goes with the market and the exchange of privately owned bonds. After all, who is a bearer that needs to be serviced? Who is a bearer of a German bond reparation uh, debt? It could be anyone. It could even be a German citizen. Second, public international law builds states as abstract legal entities, having debts vis-a-vis -vis each other. And public international law only governs the debt obligation, but it is absolutely blind and wants to ignore the issue of the contribution to the debt. The civil law distinction between l'obligation à la dette et la contribution à la dette, that distinction does not exist in international law. International law does not pierce the veil of sovereignty. And how states collect the debt domestically is of no interest to international law. Moreover, international law is premised on the paradigm of state continuity. So as a matter of principle, if we think abstractly, as international law invites us to do, if we think abstractly over an infinite period of time, even the poorest nation on the planet has theoretically an unlimited capacity to pay. The state remains, the state continues to exist, it is always the same, and a huge sum of money can always be paid through installments stretching over a huge number of years. But Versailles teaches us that such oversimplifications are unsustainable in the real life. Paying odious debts generation after generation simply does not make sense, politically speaking. Therefore, despite the fine legal abstractions built by public international law, time, time that governs all lives, time is of the essence. And let me submit to you that when designing reparation schemes for historically following historical events like First World War or other wars, or Hans van Oud knows uh, as president of the Ethiopia Eritrea Claims Commission, he has a direct experience of this. Designing reparation schemes for historical events, uh, when we do that, time should never be ignored. If ignored, and to paraphrase Keynes that I used at the beginning, and by swapping morality for legality, if we ignore time, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that international legality, interpreted as a crude moralism, might be also very injurious to the world. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Pierre. You have completed uh, the picture of how the allied powers have, among themselves, very nicely allocated a rather substantial compensation if I may use that understatement. Um, you have given a specific content to the notion Diktat of Versailles. Um, our present politicians are criticized not to have a long-term view, 
but uh, the drafters of Versailles and of the mechanism, maybe they had a too long-term view and maybe um, we have become wiser in the meantime. Now, we have spoken about states, but uh, war also affects private people. Private people uh, who suffered uh, in the war, and uh, this topic will be discussed by Didier Boden. Uh, Didier Boden is uh, also a Belgian. Belgian is I never have been at a conference or a session where the name of Belgium has been mentioned so often. And as a matter of fact, also three members of the panel are also Belgians. Uh, this is a Belgian, uh, the return of Belgium to the international scene. Um, however, <laughs> for the moment, I would say. Um, however, uh, Didier Boden then uh, went to Paris uh, at the Sorbonne where he made his uh, PhD thesis and then he became an associate professor where he teaches uh, philosophy of law and uh, private international law. But he has a specific interest in the position of uh, private citizens during the war. Uh, he is preparing, he, uh, he is, uh, preparing or finishing a book on the impact of the Nuremberg uh, uh, laws on, uh, as it is ap had been applied by different uh, countries I, on private people. Uh, I know that he is also interested in the position of refugees uh, because of the war and their private status. But now he will speak about um, the uh, private rights in wartime and in the context of reparations. Didier, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excellencies, dear colleagues, good evening. I thank, I thank very much Professor Hélène Ruiz Fabry and Professor Burkhardt Hess for their invitation and for the permission they gave me to change a little bit the title and content of my intervention, which is going to be devoted to the relations between occupied state and occupying power, the point of view of the occupied state with elements of criminal law, private law, and private international law. The legal aspect of the war are not limited to questions of respect or violation by the occupying power of its obligations under international law. War has also many consequences in state law and more specifically in criminal law, private law and private international law of the occupied state. In this respect, occupied Belgium is a legal laboratory of the greatest interest. That is why this contribution is focalized on that state, even if some judgment from other countries are about to be mentioned. The main but, the, but not the only one legal basis of the answer to the question of the relations between the occupied state and the occupying power is Article 43 of the appendix to the 1907 Hague Convention. This article has to be briefly presented. Among Belgian courts, discrepancies in the interpretation of that article arose at the very beginning of the First World War but the most extreme and extremely interesting interpretation ended up prevailing. On 18th October 1907, at the end of the Second International Peace Conference of The Hague, many conventions were signed. One of the most important was the Convention Respecting the Laws and Customs of War on Land. It was ratified by Austria, Hungary, Belgium, France, Germany, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Russia, United Kingdom, United States, and 21 other powers of that time. It entered into force before the First World War. The very text of the convention is complemented by a most important annex entitled Regulations Concerning the Laws and Customs of war on land. Article 43 of the annexed regulation provides the authority of the legitimate power having in fact passed into the hands of the occupant, the latter shall take all the measures in his power to restore and ensure as far as possible public order and safety while respecting, unless absolutely prevented, 
the laws in force in the country. The French version is a little bit different. The main phrase is um, l'ordre et la vie publique. In uh, it's corresponding, supposed to correspond to public, and or public order and safety. The proceedings of the Hague Conference indicate that this provision implies no recognition by the legal government of any right of the occupant on the occupied territory. As to the meaning of the phrase public order and safety, l'ordre et la vie publique in French, the proceedings indicate that it refers to the material order, security or general safety, l'ordre matériel, la sécurité ou la sûreté générale, on the one hand, and the social function and ordinary transactions which constitute the everyday life, les fonctions sociales, les transactions ordinaires qui constituent la vie de tous les jours, on the other hand. The Belgian courts had to interpret uh, Article 43 from the very beginning of the First World War. Initially, two opposed interpretations emerged that of two very courageous judges, Raymond de Ricaire and Maurice Benoit, on the one hand, and that of the majority, on the other hand. According to the interpretation, which was initially that of the majority, Article 43 of the regulation annexed to the Convention of 1907 transmitted the legislative legitimate legislative power to the occupant. The opportunity to adopt this interpretation was given by a decree of 20th November 1914 of the German general governor of the occupied Belgium, which gave to the Belgian justices of peace, the lowest court in Belgium, the jurisdiction for disputes between landlords and tenants when these disputes resulted from the circumstances of the war, destruction of the rented good, and so on. It seems that a majority of the Belgian justices of peace accepted to exercise that jurisdiction, despite the fact that it had been given to them by the uh, German general governor in violation of the Belgian constitution and the Belgian laws. The argument was considering Article 43 of the Annex of the 1907 Hague Convention, the decrees of the German general governor have the force of flow in Belgium. It is a quotation uh, extracted from a judgment of the Justice of Peace of Châtelet. Uh, I have added some other references and I could add 20 other uh, judgments telling exactly the same thing. But at the same moment, another interpretation was adopted by at least two extremely courageous judges, Raymond de Ricaire, judge at the Brussels Court of First Instance, and Maurice Benoit, a vice chairman of the same court. The judgment granted by de Ricaire were the most elaborated. This is a short series of quotations from the judgment uh, granted by uh, de Ricaire. Currently in Belgium, there are two legal orders, that of the occupying power and that of the occupied state. The Belgian courts must only obey the rules of the Belgian legal order. If the occupant wants to be obeyed by courts in Belgium, it has to create its own courts. Under the occupation, yes. During the occupation, the Belgian courts have the duty to continue to judge as long as the source of their legitimacy remains. The source of the legitimacy of the Belgian political powers is the election. The source of the legitimacy of the Belgian judicial power is independence. As long as the independence of Belgian judges is respected by the occupant, they have to continue to judge. Would their independence be infringed? They would have to cease carrying out 
their functions. It is a whole theory, constitutional theory, and international law theory of the function of the, of the judges under occupation. And with an announcement, for the moment, in January 1915, is our independence infringed or not? If it is not, when shall it be? And at that moment, we will have to cease to exercise our functions, what is what will be called the strike. The interpretation of the judges de Ricard and Benoit, contradicted by an important judgment of the Belgian Cour de Cassation in 1916, needed three years to convince the other Belgian judges, but they did it. The critical opportunity was given by the decision of the German occupant to incite a group of Flemish nationalists to constitute itself as a Council of Flanders, Rad van Vlaanderen, which between November 1917 and January 1918 pronounced the deposing of the Belgian government, proclaimed the independence of the Flemish state and appointed its ministers under the occupation. The judges of the Court of Appeal of Brussels reacted by using an old procedural provision which allowed them, by an unanimous vote, to order to the general public prosecutor to instruct prosecutions against the member of the de facto group having taken the name of Rad van Vlaanderen under the occupation. The resolution was voted unanimously by the judges of the Court of Appeal of Brussels. The prosecutions were initiated. Certain members of the Raad van Vlaanderen were arrested and presented by the Belgian police before the Belgian investigating criminal judge. The German army did not agree. <laughs> and came to the courthouse of Brussels to free them by force and to arrest the chairman of all the chambers of the Court of Appeal. Three days later, on, on 11th February 1918, and in the following days, all the courts of the kingdom decided that whereas the independence of the Belgian courts has been infringed, they had to cease carrying out their functions. This led at a period of anarchy in all the country. The crime increased considerably. The occupant had to create its own courts and administration by the displacement of judges and civil servants from Germany. While the war had entered its most difficult phase for the German Reich, the occupant was suddenly in the necessity to devote valuable resources to try to regain the control of the situation in Belgium. The strike of the Belgian judges, even if it was not perfectly followed, for instance, in the courts for the protection of the children, contributed certainly, but to an extent difficult to determine precisely, to the final defeat of Germany. This had consequences on the interpretation given to the Article 43 of the 1907 regulation during the Second World War. On the Belgian side, as much as on the German one, the interpretation given by the judges de Ricard and Benoit was considered in 1940 as the basis for the new modus, modus vivendi. The strike of the Belgian judges is the ultimate consequence of a conception of the relations between the legal order of the occupant and that of the occupied state characterized by uh, the non-permeability. This non-permeability, each time it was adopted, prevented the application of the legal norm of the occupant by the courts of the occupied state. 
However, a more precise analysis results in noting that the effects simply conceivable or actually observed that the occupied state gives to the legal norms of the occupant are not limited to the assertion of their non-applicability. This is made understandable by a distinction between categories of effects supplemented by some illustrations. Those who study the relations between legal orders, especially in private international law and in the part of the state law concerning the effects given to religious norms, are accustomed to distinguish two types of operations, um, auf Deutsch die Anwendung und die Berücksichtigung, en français l'application et la prise en considération, in English or at least in continental English, the application and the taken into consideration. Uh, it has just been used, by the way, um, in a very recent judgment of the European Court of Justice in the case Niki Foridis. Uh, the whole judgment is based on, the, on that distinction. What is a taking, uh, taking into consideration? Well, a norm A is taken into consideration on the occasion of the application of a rule B when A plays a role at the stage of the verification of the conditions of B. Let's imagine a rule B providing that at the conditions B1, B2, B3, a certain legal consequences X uh, shall be uh, decided. Well, it is conceivable that a norm A plays a role when the conditions B1, B2, B3 are checked. This role consist, may consist of an addition of condition, a substitution of condition, or a confirmation of condition. I have three pages, but I don't have the time to present precisely and completely the three pages. Uh, I ask you only to read the last line. In an addition of conditions, you have to add the conditions B1, B2, B3, and the conditions of the norm taken into consideration to have the consequences of the applied uh, rules. So B1, B2, B3 plus A1, A2, A3 uh, shall provoke the legal consequence um, uh, provided by the uh, applied rule. In a substitution of condition, one or several conditions, the last line, uh, one or, or several of the conditions of the norm taken into consideration will take the place of some conditions of the applied rule. When I have to explain that to my student in first year, I uh, take the example of the Erasmus exchange uh, program uh, with the results of their exams. In another country, they will have their French uh, diploma. The notes, uh, the, the marks obtained abroad will take the place of the French mark to obtain only the French diploma. And the confirmation of condition, it's a very, very odd, but very quite frequent uh, reasoning. I really don't have the time to present it in details. Um, in such a reasoning, the judges, for instance, are going to say uh, B1, B2, B3 are fulfilled. And by the way, A1, A2, A, A3 also, and so uh, I will uh, allow, I will um, decide the consequences of the applied rule. It's a very odd but quite frequent uh, way of reasoning of the judges in a lot of countries. Another classification can be made according to whether the taking into consideration expresses the respect, friendship and esteem toward the norm taken into consideration and the legal order from which it comes or expresses the disrespect, enmity, and hostility towards the norm taken into consideration and the legal order from which it comes, or expresses neither respect nor hostility. The two classifications cross, so 
we may imagine this variety of um, attitudes, of effects given by a legal order to the norms of another legal order. I don't have the time to present all the possibility on the screen. I will only quote um, maybe on the last line, second column. Contracts between individuals concluded to pursue projects of the occupant are contra bono mores. This was decided by Belgian judges during the, the occupation in the First World War and also during the Second Occupation during the Second World War. Um, more famous, um, Le Fait du Prince Occupant, uh, the, some decision taken by the, the occupying power that uh, prevent a debtor to perform uh, his contractual obligation. Uh, shall be characterized as a force majeure uh, case, and so the debtor will be exonerated of his uh, responsibility for non-performance. Three illustration uh, dating from the First World War. A first, uh, three illustration of uh, taking into consideration. Uh, first in criminal law. Article 491 of the Belgian Penal Code punishes the abus de confiance, breach of trust. In 1917, the recruitment office of the German army in Belgium gives 50 francs to a petty criminal to let him buy the necessary equipment for a travel to Germany where he should joined, join the German army. A few days later, he comes to the Belgian police station to denounce himself for various robberies and swindlings. Uh, one of those robberies concerned the 50 francs, the, yes, 50 francs given by the German army, the German recruitment office. Um, he bought some beer and, and <laughs> drank the... So he accused himself of several robberies, and w one of them was the concerned the 50 francs. Um, he has presented to the, uh, before the Criminal Court of Brussels on 8th May uh, 1917, and the question was, is the recruitment office of the German army victim of a breach of trust, as would have been a company or a neighbor in such a situation. Well, according to the court, the court of Brussels under the occupation, but it was the Ricard, the judge de Ricard, according to the court, Article 491 of the Belgian code, Penal Code does not protect the undertakings which established under the auspices of the occupant have the only goal to support its military, economic, and political interests by providing recruits which constitutes a crime against the external security of the Belgian state punished by the Article 115 of the Belgian uh, Penal Code. In the same judgment, Article 491 is not applicable when the d diverted money was given to the defendant with the only aim of making an illicit use of it, contrary to the Belgian law, an immoral use for criminal ends. Hmm. So he was not condemned for this reason. <laughs> this decision can be characterized as a refusal of a friendly taking into consideration by confirmation of condition. For the ones among us who like theories and cate theoretical categories. <laughs> Second example, second illustration in contracts law. According to Article 1722 of the Belgian Civil Code, that is to say the Napoleonic Code, if during the contract of lease, the lease property is entirely destroyed by force majeure, the contract is automatically termi terminated without any indemnity. If it is destroyed only partly, 
by force majeure, the tenant can request a reduction of the rent or the termination of the contract. Now, if the property is located in the military rear area, uh, auf Deutsch Etappengebiet, uh, near the combat zone, and if uh, the occupant prohibits the tenant to use it as it was meant by uh, the contract, is it a case of force majeure? The civil court of Gand answered uh, affirmatively, which is a totally normal uh, characterization of this kind of uh, situation. This decision can be analyzed as a taking into consideration by confirmation of condition, neither friendly nor hostile. And a last illustration, in international private law, but out of the occupied Belgium. Um, sorry. Another example of relations between state legal orders in wartime, which shows once more the variety of the possible effects and how they are sometimes surprising. The British law called Trading with Enemy Act 1914 had repercussions in many countries, including in Germany. The most famous judgment on this subject was given in 1918, but during the war, uh, by the Reichsgericht, the Civil and Criminal uh, Supreme Court of the German Reich. In this case, a German tradesman and an English company concluded on 1st January 1914 a framework contract concerning future sales of extracts of quebracho a tree used for its tannin. When the war started, the English company was still obliged to deliver 6,360 tons of extract to the German party. The company refused to carry out its obligations with the reason that in the event of performance of the contract, it would have been liable for heavy penalties under the British Trading with Enemy Act 1914. The German party prosecuted the English party before the German, the German courts and claimed damages for failure to perform the contract. He was dismissed. The German courts dismissed the German uh, claimant and um, gave reason to the English uh, defendant. According to the Reichstag, uh, the, the Reichsgericht, sorry, according to the Reichsgericht, admittedly the German, the German courts must refuse the application, the anwendung of this British law because it is contrary to the public policy of German private international law. But in this case, the law of the contract was the German law, not English law. And under German civil law, the force majeure exonerates the debtor from his liability. And the British Act fulfills the criteria of definition of uh, the force majeure in German civil law. The British Act is not applicable, but it has to be taken into consideration. So the law of the enemy has to be taken into consideration. This decision can be analyzed as a taking into consideration by confirmation of condition, neither friendly nor hostile. It is a very famous decision, uh, quoted and analyzed in the PhD thesis of Professor Kinch, who is uh, here today. Uh, the title of his PhD thesis was Le fait du prince étranger, and it is a, a paradigmatic illustration of this kind of reasoning. Before the beginning of the Second World War, the Regierungspräsident of Cologne, the préfet, Egert uh, Reder, was in charge of preparing the legal and administrative aspects of the future occupation of Belgium by Germany. What an organization. Hmm? Years later, we have to prepare the new occupation, future occupation of Belgium, our dear neighbor. He studied what happened during the First World War 
and was very impressed by the strike of the Belgian judges in 1918. He concluded that if the Reich wanted to occupy Belgium in the least expensive possible way, it would have to respect the independence of the Belgian judges as much as possible and as long as possible. Well, two years later, in 1940, the strange relations between occupying power and occupied state started again with acceptances and refusals of application, with acceptances and refusals of taking into consideration, and even with a very short strike of the judges in 1942. I thank you for your attention. Uh, can I ask my panelists to go back? Uh, thank you, Didier. Um, I learned that there are some Belgian petty criminals who are trying to be very clever, uh, t cashing 50 Belgian francs, uh, and then, then going to the, to the authorities to denounce themselves as thieves. Unfortunately, they met and uh, Judge the regular, uh, which decided which congratulate them, which decided that it was not a crime, so that the poor petty man had to go to Germany. Uh, this was not in his interest, and also probably he, there was one soldier more in the German army, which was not a patriotic act of Judge de Regere. But anyway, that shows that things are not always as easy as possible. <laughs> okay, are there questions? Yes, uh, please there. No, no, uh, you first, and then uh, Professor Hess, please. Um, I have a question for Didier Baudin about um, the, uh, the, the regime the Germans used with the, when they sent their own judges to Belgium. What, which law did they apply? Was it modified Belgian law? Was it German law? Which language did the courts use? Um, French, Flemish, German? Um, how did, how did they operate? I mean, it's uh, sending hundreds of Francophone German judges to Belgium. That would have been very difficult at the, in the middle of the war when they needed French-speaking people to occupy other parts of uh, Francophone parts of Europe. Please. Uh, good question. Um, we know that um, the German judges uh, in Belgium in 1918 uh, proceeded in German and so uh, it provoked a lot of difficulties but because they needed uh, advocated, uh, advocates um, speaking uh, German and they needed also to find some advocates accepting to participate to this masquerade and, uh, and it um, the duration of that experience was only a few months, uh, approximately from March, April to, to September, uh, to November. Uh, so it, it was a, a total disaster uh, with, uh, without almost, uh, with almost no, no effectivity. And so they worked in German, and I guess, but I'm not sure, but I guess that they applied only German law. Th thank you. Maybe to uh, my name is Lisbeth Leinsat. Um, uh, on the same issue, uh, th thank you very much. I had never heard of the uh, the strike of of Belgian judges, but then I'm from a country that was still neutral during World War One. Um, in your discussion of the Hague regulations on land warfare, the annex to the Fourth Convention, um, I'm I have a few questions uh, uh, about. Um, the, the exact um, legal thinking behind that. Now, as a starting point, uh, Article 43, I think, these days uh, is most of all used as a be um, when you when you discuss the law of occupation uh, as a as a starting point for the very fundamental issue that the occupier is only there for as long as the occupation uh, takes and is like a custodian, a trustee, and has to guarantee the functioning of the legal system. Now, um, 
I am slightly puzzled by the, and this is what the previous speaker alluded to, uh, by the, um, let's say, the entry of German judges. Um, another step could have been to look for judges that might want to work with the occupying power. At least that is what happened uh, in the Netherlands uh, during the occupation in the Second World War. Uh, there were a number of judges who didn't want to uh, work in that legal system, and so other lawyers were found who made a very quick career and ended up being law uh, judges uh, very, very, very rapidly. Um, but I'm perhaps, and this is looking at um, the way in which the law of occupation ends up before judges these days, particularly with respect to the situation in Israel and Palestine, where, first of all, um, the uh, regulations on land warfare are invoked before judges. Um, from what I gather, um, your discussion is one really about uh, a private international law in which there doesn't really seem to be a reference to the applicability of uh, the Hague regulations. Um, whereas in, for instance, court cases against the building of the Jerusalem Light Railway um, before the court, I think, of Versailles, how could it be more appropriate? One of the issues was that the court said, well, these rules are not directly applicable. Uh, now, that, I think, was a private law case, and there has been a somewhat related case uh, with respect to the building of the wall before a Dutch criminal court, where also on the basis of the applic possible applicability of the rules on land warfare, uh, a number of NGOs tried to persuade the public prosecutor that this was applicable and you should uh, prosecute. Neither of those cases were, were successful. So um, it looks as though uh, in the First World War, and m mind you, at that time, I mean, the, the, the regulations on land warfare are relatively new law. They're from 1907 and we're talking 1914, 1918. The whole debate is about, it looks like, being about the Hague regulations, but they're not mentioned because it goes in another track, which is the more conflict of laws track. Thank you. As to the first question, uh, why the German occupant, occupant uh, did not uh, look for um, more open-minded Belgian judges. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I was a little bit short on this story, but um, so I, I said the German army entered the, the um, courthouse to free by force uh, five members of the Rad van Vlaanderen and the day after to arrest all the chairmen of all the sections of the uh, Court of Appeal. That very day, there was a um, general meeting of the judges of the Court of Appeal of Brussels. They said, in this moment, there is an infringement of our independence. We have to cease our activity as a judge. In the evening, the Cour de Cassation gathered in general meeting and voted exactly the same text. I think that it was a Friday. The Monday, all the courts of the kingdom voted the same text. So, um, the message was quite clear for the occupant. It, it was not worthful to, to look for uh, kind judges. Uh, as to the other question, um, th there are two things. First, I, I'm not sure that the, the Hague Convention and the Annex and the, the Article 43 are invoked in the Palestinian uh, case. Uh, second, you said that uh, some rules are applied but not invoked. Uh, one very um, uh, spectacular thing in Belgium d during the First World War and during the Second World War is that almost everyone knew the Article 43 
of the Reglement Annex, and it was in all the letters sent to the general, uh, the German general governor of Belgium. The protests coming from um, lawyers or uh, people knowing nothing about law except Article 43, uh, writing to the German general governor, telling that what you have just decided in such or such case cannot be under the Article 43 of the Reglement Annex. So, it, this article was new, better than the most famous article of the Civil Code, or, or, or such or such article of the Constitution. And it was in numerous um, uh, letters of protest sent to the uh, uh, German general governor. Uh, so it was very, uh, it was a very famous article, and it was invoked permanently by all the members of the population uh, with enough courage to write to the German occupant, telling that he is in this moment violating the rules the law and the, the, the treaties that Germany ratified. Thank you. Professor Hess. I have a very short question and then another one. The short question is about the judgments of 1915. Were they published in the Monitor Belge? Were they accessible? There was also a kind, certainly, of control by the military, the occupying powers. Uh, what we call censure. So I'm, I'm curious to, to learn whether this was an open, accessible judgment or whether you find it somewhere in the file or in later publications. And my second question goes to the complex of uh, reparations. I was very much impressed when I saw um, the Belgian law concerning uh, la réparation des dommages de guerre which had been enacted in 1918, which starts Le peuple belge a trois de réparation pour tout dommage de guerre, and also by the uh, installation of uh, specific courts which heard all these cases. These were mass claims within Belgium because Belgium was completely destroyed by the war and uh, by the German occupants. So uh, here they started in a very individual way by assessing the war damages. And uh, I understand also the Reparation Commission a little bit as a continuation of this individual assessment at the international level. But it was, of course, a failure because it, Germany was unable, as you said it, to, to pay uh, the overall amount. So the judicial approach was overturned by a political uh, solution finally, and uh, this is something that jurists have also to take into account. My last question here would be um, the Blan, uh, especially um, uh, the plans concerning the German reparation debts were negotiated in London. Was this a little bit a precursor of what we call today the London Club and the Paris Club? concerning sovereign debts which are not really payable or was a me mechanism totally different? Certainly it was, but maybe you can see some parallels. Yeah. Please divide the, the answers among yourselves. <coughs> the short answer to the short question. Um, during the occupation uh, in the First World War, um, one of the main um, legal journal continued to be, uh, went on publishing, that is the Pazikrisi Belge, uh, which only judgment, without comment. And uh, so it was published, but only with um, pro-German uh, decisions. The other ones, the judgments of de Ricard and Benoit, uh, circulated only um, in the form of uh, personal uh, informal copies within uh, the judges of the kingdom and step by step it was well known of all the judges of the kingdom. Furthermore, uh, they were not at the top of the hierarchy but a sort of informal order 
uh, of the judges, progressively, of we could say an underground order, was created with, at the top, Benoit and de Ricoeur, with a superior, a higher uh, rank than the member of the Supreme Court. So, but it took, it necessitated time to create such an order, such a, a clandestine ghost <laughs> organization of the judges. And finally, in, uh, at the end of 1917, beginning on, of 1918, to be able to impose that uh, vision of the situation to all the judges of the kingdom. But it was a hard, a hard work for those two very courageous uh, judges. And the judgment, of course, was published, their judgment was published just after the war. <laughs> uh, the other questions? Yes, very briefly. I'm not an expert on the Belgian law, the domestic law of 1918 on, on reparation, but the, the basic mechanism was to institute a possibility for individuals that had suffered losses during the war, whatever the cause, uh, be it German uh, uh, military operations or Belgian or Allied military operations, uh, to, to get compensation from the Belgian state. And then, presumably, the national budget would be, through the German payments, would, would so there is a kind of simply financial uh, circle. But there, there has been a huge litigation, I mean, many, many years of litigation by thousands of people in, 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 in the Conseil d'État on those... Uh, uh, on the basis of that Belgian law, uh, but but yes, it's a it's based on a certain form of solidarity between the citizens of the state and the state being a claimant in international law. That's it. Uh, and 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 on the pooling uh, on the on the bonds negotiated in London, uh, as I understand it, the London Club and the Paris Club are are are, are means to uh, try to organize. Uh, when a state goes bankrupt, uh, to organize uh, a collective settlement and, and, and agree on a cut on, on the debt. The, the bonds were, were simply promises to pay, uh, and they were traded. But, but I, I would not relate them to, to a mechanism of uh, collective uh, uh, reduction of, of the debt. They, they, they were just instruments that were traded. Yes, in France, there was a strong involvement of law professors, notably of the Faculty of Paris, during the war, very quickly, to elaborate uh, a plan of uh, compensation uh, for the civilian. And uh, there were uh, some domestic laws voted uh, before the end of the Versailles uh, Conference and the Versailles Treaty in 1990. But curiously, uh, this um, law professor were involved uh, during the, the peace conference. In the other commission is a commission about uh, sanctions and with the idea of uh, a tribunal for war crimes. It was the case uh, for Larno, the, the dean of the Paris uh, faculty. And uh, the, the main ideas of uh, the system of reparation in Versailles Treaty, and especially with the basis of Article 231 uh, and the following, are not French ideas. Uh, it's American ideas and a British idea to integrate war pension in the reparation. Of course, the French government accept, and it was a, a, a bad idea to, to accept uh, this formula, but uh, it's not a French plan that was integrated according to me, in the Versailles Treaty. If I can add, just uh, as out of curiosity, one note on the inclusion of the pension. So that, the, the, the Brits requested the war costs to be included. The Americans resisted the ID, and the French resisted the ID because the Americans presented to the French uh, tables, and the French saw that if cost of war was included, the French part of the reparation would be highly diminished. So they thought twice, and they said, okay, we don't, include uh, the cost of the war. But then the Brits came back with another claim on pensions. 
And, and for the same reason, the Americans presented to the French uh, uh, calculation according to which, well, that will be very advantageous to the Brits, so you don't want to include that. Including the pension had the effect of doubling the German debt. And there was a famous uh, meeting during which uh, Wilson, the president of the US, said uh, after being submitted uh, a, a, a paper by General Smuts, uh, South Africa, uh, from South Africa representing the Commonwealth, uh, Wilson said, uh, to its own delegates who were opposing the inclusion of, of pensions, he said, logic, logic, I don't give a damn about logic, I'm going to include pensions. And that was it. And Smuts had written uh, uh, to Poincaré, uh, you say that the chimney of a factory in France needs to be uh, made restored. And what about the widow of a Commonwealth soldier? Do you give more value to the chimney of a factory in northern France than to the widow of a Commonwealth soldier? And that was it. Okay, the very last question, because I know we are over time, but you are already a long time on the waiting list. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Jennifer Ballant. Thanks so much for a fantastic panel. And I think this can be brief because some of what I was going to ask has been answered. But I wanted to ask the first two speakers to elaborate a bit more on this process of civilian claims and who, you know, who was making these claims. You talked about the 4,000 boxes. What's in those 4,000 boxes? Were these claims that were made um, on behalf of civilians by governments in the way that you've just spoken about, you know, trying to work out the pensions or was there an opportunity, you know, for civilians themselves to put those claims forward? So it's quite, you know, this relationship between the state and civilians. Was it a ruse, you know, or was it actually there was a legitimate claim making as you've been talking about in terms of the follow-up, you know, since then? So and we, um, I'm happy to talk more about it afterwards if we need to finish. Thank you. In, in the archive boxes of the RC, there are all the claims presented by uh, every state for reparation. Uh, for example, all the claims of the French government that were assessed and checked by a delegate of another country. For example, all the French claims were checked by Bradbury, the British delegate, who said that Generally speaking, the, the French uh, claims were uh, based and uh, were the best uh, report from the national delegation, but it discussed uh, very strongly uh, some aspect, for example, the evaluation of the destruction of coal mines in northern France and uh, the real price of these mines. And all this uh, enormous work representing probably uh, 3,000 boxes uh, in the archives, in the, in the general uh, um, uh, archives, was not used, did not serve to anything, because when the decision was taken to fix the amount, here, it was a bargaining between uh, the smaller amount proposed by Bradbury, the uh, higher amount proposed by the French delegation. Each delegation received orders from their government. They discussed uh, in the lobbies of the commission, and they discussed only uh, 45 minutes in the uh, official meeting to say that it was uh, 132 uh, billions of uh, gold marks. And all the work prepared was not used. It was afterwards that the uh, Belgian um, uh, delegate, the, the Belgian delegate, Tunis, like Bradbury, uh, was a specialist of uh, finance. That was not the case of the French delegates. Uh, but there were also French civil servants to, to, to prepare the fights. And afterwards, they say, we have made a kind of reduction with uh, a, a, a proportion of the claims uh, according if it is uh, uh, goods or buildings or lands. But uh, it's a fantasy uh, to uh, explain what is only a, a political bargaining. And of course, 
the, the first sign of the weakening of the RC, uh, which was not able to uh, have uh, an impartial deliberation grounded on a legal uh, basis. I have the feeling that we can st uh, speak about this topic till tomorrow morning, but maybe that's not your feeling. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I would say that we are um, uh, seven minutes over time because the topic was quite interesting, the questions were quite interesting. Thank you very much for the panel.